This episode has been brought to you by Ice-T Aesthetics. ND 2000. In Kimlaska shall be born one who inherits the power of Lorelei. He will be a boy of royal blood with hair of red. He shall be called the Light of the Sacred Flame, and he will lead Kimlaska Landaldeer to new prosperity. Since its 2005 release in Japan and 2006 release in North America, Tales of the Abyss has been upheld by many fans as the franchise's greatest work, and for good reason. While it has certainly been surpassed in areas such as its combat, visuals, and OST, it excels in its story, characters, and world, and just how it weaves them together as one cohesive narrative experience. The execution of which has not only never been matched within the franchise, but few games even outside of it rarely come close. As such, this is a game that has earned a timeless status, and should be upheld as a shining example of RPG writing worthy of being studied for generations to follow. Tales of the Abyss is the eighth mainline entry in the Tales of franchise, though bears no narrative ties to any other entry. It was directed by Yoshito Higuchi, who just previously helped direct the game that put the Tales of series on the map for many modern fans, Tales of Symphonia. Yoshito would once again be working alongside former Symphonia producer Makoto Yoshizumi and character artist Kosuke Fujishima, who really defined the series look for the era. Motoi Sakuraba would of course return to fill his role as composer, though the OST was also helped by composers Shinji Tamura and Motu Fujiwara. At its release, the game received generally positive scores in both Japan and America, though official PlayStation Magazine apparently only gave it a 5 out of 10. No big deal, people can have their opinions and all that jazz. What are you doing? I have a death note around here somewhere, okay, and I want to find out if it works. In late 2008 to 2009, a 26-episode anime adaptation of the game aired on Japanese networks, later releasing on Funimation in late 2011 for a worldwide market. Three manga adaptations would also follow, some retelling parts of the game, others telling character-focused side stories. Also, in 2011 through to early 2012, a port of the game to 3DS was released worldwide and is the only other place besides the PlayStation 2 this game can be played. It is a shame that despite the amazing reputation the title still holds today, it remains so inaccessible. But with any luck, maybe Bandai has plans in mind for it. Today, we're going to be looking at the original release on the PlayStation 2. We're going to take a brief peek at how it stands out from its contemporaries, and how other aspects of the game have possibly aged. We're going to start by looking back at the story, but not before a word from today's sponsor. Wife. Ice-T Aesthetics offers quality clothing with original designs and designs featuring some of your favorite and most prolific anime and manga at a fraction of the cost of other online outlets. Like this Ava Unit 1 shirt I'm wearing here. You know who's on my shirt? The Ava guy. I said who, not what? Unit 1. Another day closer to divorce. If you would like to be like me and get in the f***ing robot, head over to Ice-T Aesthetics with the link in the description and use the promo code TARX to save an additional 10% on your order. But what if I wanted to buy specifically three or more of these high quality items at once? Then I get a deal for you. When placing orders on three or more items at once, use promo code TARX20 to boost your savings to 20% off. These shirts and sweaters really are pretty rad, and they ride that line of subtle and personal enough in their designs that you can wear them out like any other article of clothing without fear of being noticed as the weeb you are from anybody that isn't also a weeb. So if you like what you see, check them out. It'll help them out, it'll help me out, it'll help this channel out, and it'll help you out with your fashion as well. And of course, do not forget those promo codes. Save Save yourself some money. That's Tarx for 10% off or Tarx20 for 20% off on three items or more. Thank you, Ice-T Aesthetics, for this opportunity, and thank all of you for checking it out. Now, let's get back to the video. Tales of the Abyss easily boasts one of the strongest stories in series history, though the little bit we talk about it in this section might not make that as apparent as it should be. It's also worth noting up front that for as good as the story is, quite obviously it is not 
perfect. While the pace starts off incredibly solid, it does tend to fall into a rather familiar pit the series often does in the third act, where the runtime starts to get a little bloated and a lot of your time is spent dealing with minor interruptions over and over again that delay the progression of the plot at times to a frustrating degree. The game world is also steeped in so much lore and jargon that less observational players or people who tend to just have a shorter memory may not have the easiest time keeping up with it. For instance, at one point in the game, a seventh Phonus and his friends escort the Phone Master to the Sephiroth so they can interface with the passage rings to prevent the outer world from falling into the Klefoth. And that most assuredly makes sense if you spent enough hours in this world. But it really does take hours to establish and understand what all of that means. So let's dial back the clock a bit and start the story at the beginning. <laughs> We first see our main character, Luke Von Fabra, one of the main core pillars of this game that has helped it endure so well throughout the ages. Immediately, we're given something interesting to chew on with him before the game even really begins. Luke is a child of nobility, but following a kidnapping years back that resulted in the total loss of his memories prior to the event, he has been kept in captivity within his family's manor. With a longing desire to be free, independent, and a person of great import, and upon the intense influence of those who deal with his family in their noble estate, Luke has become something of a challenging character, an entitled victim, a silver-spooned prisoner. It would be an understatement to say some players tend to bounce off Luke as a character, especially early on, as he is kind of a dick. Luke, thank you for your help. Please join me for just a little longer. Well, I've come this far, might as well. He's ignorant, arrogant, selfish, and demanding. But at the same time, you can't help but feel for his plight and understand that these character flaws aren't his own doing. He is, after all, a product of his environment. And he is a product of such rare quality, I struggle to think of another character to easily relate him to. One day in this mansion estate, a swordmaster by the name of General Van Grants is giving Luke a lesson in the manor's central courtyard. When things are suddenly interrupted and Luke's meandering life gets flipped turned upside down. A woman by the name of Tyr, having infiltrated the grounds and made her way to the inner sanctums, launches an attack against Van with intent to kill. Luke attempts to defend his mentor, however when Tyr deflects his blow, something happens. A resonance occurs, the result of the sympathetic phonons within their bodies coming in contact with each other. Phonons being a sort of particle energy created by the planet storm, something I won't be explaining here, which certain people embody in different forms. Think of phonons like an expansion to the the standard model theory of particle physics, but an extension that can grant special, basically magical abilities, and whose existence is not self-sufficient like the rest of the standard model, as phonons require the planet storm for their production. This resonance causes Luke and Tyr to be transported together to some small waterfront area which we come to find is far from Luke's home, and is actually located deep within a territory Luke's homeland and noble contemporaries have a strong growing tension with. This is where our journey really begins, in the heart of a foreign land. Land. Luke and Tyr, the would-be assassin, must put differences and distrust aside to find their way home. But that distrust will always remain. Why was Tyr trying to kill Van? Is she trying to prevent Van from doing something unspeakable? Or is Van an obstacle in her path to committing atrocities? From here, things unravel rather quickly. Mysterious voices that speak in Luke's mind become more frequent, often accompanied by strong headaches. The tensions between the lands of Kimblaska, Lanvaldir, and Malkuth have our party, who is made of residents of both lands, constantly dodging authorities and taking the back roads to remain hidden, lest their presence be the spark that turns tension to fire and ignites the war somebody operating behind the scenes clearly wants to happen. And therein lies one of Tales of the Abyss's most labyrinthian mysteries. What is the source of the tension and who is driving it? Is it Kim Laska or Malkuth? Or could it possibly be somebody within the Order of Lorelei, the world's reigning religious power who itself has been split in two over disagreements and how one should go about fulfilling the score. Essentially, this religion's guiding premonitory scripture. Who can truly be trusted? Well certainly not this guy. The answer to this question is one that cannot become too easily, as every character, every institution, and every practice in this universe has a deep and complicated history that has been carefully and lovingly woven into the plot in such a way that tracing its thread to the right conclusion too early is just not possible short of sheer dumb luck. Tales of the Abyss is also a shockingly dark game, though it doesn't come off as brooding or edgy as, say, Tales of Berseria. Rather, it looks to crush you with its dark and dramatic 
dramatic plot developments and make you feel sympathy not just for the victims, but also for the perpetrators of the game's most harrowing and lethal moments. It doesn't send you off to seek vengeance against those who have wronged you. In a rare display, we, the players, are put into positions where our actions cause strife on par with some of gaming's most notorious villains. And as we are made to navigate the convoluted socio-political landscapes of Aldrant, the world of Tales of the Abyss, we wonder if the path forward to a brighter future will ever be clear to us, and if there ever truly is any making up for the actions of our main party, if this cast can be redeemed and set things right after so much suffering. To say much more would be getting into spoilers, but we will be revisiting the story a bit in a later section. For now, let's look at the combat and the exploration. The combat is easily the place Tales of the Abyss has aged the most, but it's not like it's unplayable or anything. It just might be a little jarring for anybody who's only experienced some of the more modern titles. Like every Tales of game, it uses a unique combat system that is more or less just an iteration on top of the usual groundwork. The battle system is known as the Flex Range Linear Motion Battle System. If you've played Tales of Symphonia, this one will control very similar with some new bells and whistles. You have your standard attacks, which can link three to four hits in a row before before hitting its reset point. Combining your attacks with the direction button will also change how the attack is performed. For instance, holding up is a good way to attack airborne enemies. Though like most Tails games and most RPGs in general, expect flying enemies to still be annoying. You have a block button which when combined with down will also give you a magic block. Back step comes in handy as always and new to this entry we have the free roam which lets you easily control your character's traversal around the arena whereas before your direction was always tethered to the target enemy. Free roam would become a series staple going forward and for the best. It is an absolutely indispensable part of combat for this era of Tales games, and does make it a little hard to go back to Symphonia, which sadly lacked the feature. On the bottom of the screen here we have our HP meters and our TP, both of which can be restored with curatives and resting at inns, though TP is also restored slowly through attacks. TP of course is the resource we use to perform arts, the character specific special abilities that can be linked into our combos to extend the combo chain. Arts are performed by pressing an action button in combat combined with a direction button, though more arts can be chosen from your active combat party to be assigned to shortcuts using the analog stick. These arts come in a number of forms that determine their battle usage. The most common ones are base arts and arcane arts, though there are also mystic arts and altered arts. Mystic arts are simple enough to perform but take a while to unlock and get ready. Like most Tales games, we have an overlimit gauge. Once charged, we can activate overlimit for a more free flow breaks off type of combat experience. Following the performance of an arcane art while in overdrive, you can link into a mystic art, your character's most powerful combat ability, which will end your over limit when the animation concludes. Mystic arts are of course a series staple as well. Altered arts are easily the game's most unique set of arts and the ones an unseasoned player will probably see the least. When enough arts, more accurately known as phonic arts, of the same element are cast in a short amount of time, a small ring known as a field of phonons will appear on the ground. Depending on the art you are using and the element of the field of phonons as deduced from its color, some of your arts can change form while cast from within the circle. These arts are typically rather powerful and always quite exciting to discover, though most players will be likely poking at them blindly just trying new things within the fields of phonons until something happens. Half the time I found myself triggering them by accident, and it was always a fun little surprise that introduced a level of randomness into battles for me. Kind of like tripping in Smash Brothers Brawl, but you know, actually fun. That all said, a professional can definitely get a lot of use out of these, and like always, the really good players can tend to run combo chains so much longer than me that I always feel a little inadequate in comparison. But for us average folk, compared to later Tales games, this one can feel a little stilted, especially early on. It wasn't until Grace's F that combat really felt like it had more of an endless flow. With Abyss, I found myself approaching it as a set of systems. Free run to the back of an enemy, melee three or four times, arcane art, cooldown, rinse, repeat, pretty basic stuff. But with these basic limitations, I did find the game at least still maintained a somewhat respectable level of difficulty. Though the bosses in the main story pose no threats, I mean I never did see the game over screen, they can make you play pretty hard. The optional bosses, which can be a little difficult to find, are where the strategic side of combat really comes through. These guys are usually well above your level, but just barely doable when you first find them. I should note as well in combat, of course, there is a menu where you can use items on cooldowns, order party members manually 
to cast certain arts, run away, etc, etc. And of course, there's also a lot of things on the back end to help you out on your journey. Some of them essential, others you can probably forget about entirely and never realize you're missing. Of course, we have a full gauntlet of weapon and armor equips to up your stats, as well as consumables for permanent base stat increases. As you level up, your characters will also learn new add skills. Things like backstep and your mystic arts are add skills. These do a great job of helping combat feel like an ever-evolving system as you play. Then there's the capacity cores. This is probably the easiest thing to overlook, though it too can make a big difference. Capacity cores are equipables that improve your stats at a base level. Each character can have one and only one active at any time. These also make new add skills unlockable, though the game doesn't do a good job in directing players on how to properly utilize them. If I had to compare this to anything modern, I guess this would be like a more balanced version of the Master Courts from the Legend of Heroes franchise. Next we have FS Chambers. These are stat modifiers directly attached to arts. Depending on what you slot in the chamber, you can gain a number of different benefits or special abilities, such as increased knockback or decreased TP consumption. But that's about all the really important stuff. It's worth noting you can play as any of your combat party and the game does support multiplayer. So if you ever find yourself getting tired of combat, it's easy to just play as somebody new or get a buddy in on the action with you. The camera for multiplayer is a dramatic improvement over Symphonia's as well. So multiplayer is rather encouraged, though obviously not many people really use it. As an addendum though, and to segue into exploration and the technical aspects portion of this video, it's worth noting that not all arts are discovered simply by leveling up. Some can only be gained by finding side quests, which the game does very little, sometimes nothing at all to direct you towards. The same can be said about some of the special abilities that can be used to improve and expand some of your exploration. So let's check that out. So let's start by saying one of the reasons I love coming back to older Tales games like this is because of the overworlds. Sure, it's great and all to explore towns, dungeons, and the various biomes in the game doing little puzzle solving and engaging in some of the unique zone gimmicks like stealth or energy-based locks and stuff, but the feeling of exploring the overworld like some giant trekking from one location to the next, getting in battles with comically small-looking people, collecting hidden treasures and such, and really seeing the shape of the world, properly feeling like your adventure is actually taking you all across the world, it feels like a lost art in most RPGs today. This was always one of the things I felt was characteristic to the genre, and god do I miss it. It really hits the feeling of adventure in the same way, say, sailing your ship across the water in Wind Waker does. I might be in the minority here, I, I really don't know, but I definitely prefer when zones are split up and separated by overworlds like this, rather than some generic piece of dirty road that looks and feels like exploring everything else in the game. The way things are handled now, I feel creates a sort of monotony and takes some of the specialness out of actually going to a new dungeon or a new town. Everything just feels like an extension of the same thing, and new locations fail to stand out as strongly as they should as a result. To me, the overworlds make new locations feel like proper events, and I'd love to see them return. But as I said just before, despite loving the design choice from a visual and adventure perspective, Abyss does suffer pretty bad in giving players direction towards important non-story relevant things. Secret arts are a big one. A lot of our party members have special arts that can only be unlocked by following and finding side quests, most often found by talking to the right NPCs at the right times. Finding NPCs can require you, the player, to backtrack to towns you have no reason to actually be going to, and talking to NPCs who don't actually stand out at all, and without a guide you are extremely likely to miss out on a good portion of them. The same is true for the special abilities our mascot character Mew can unlock. And just as an insert here, Mew is thankfully not an annoying mascot character. He isn't just here for comic relief and crass humor. Mew actually has a story arc and a personality and reasons to care for them. He doesn't force himself into every conversation like so many misguided mascot characters today. They also serve a very useful purpose during exploration. When we first gain Mew as a companion, he is given the series staple Sorcerer's Ring, an item that has sadly fallen out of vogue in the franchise today. The Sorcerer's Ring this time grants Mew the ability to to speak with our main party, and also allows him to breathe fireballs. Now, Cheagles, the animal race Mew belongs to, natively have the ability to breathe fire. However, Mew is too young to have discovered and mastered the ability as of yet. These fireballs can be used to burn down brush and bushes to open new paths while exploring. They can also be used to attack enemies while exploring, stunning them, and allowing us to bypass them. Throughout the story, Mew will gain one more ability, which will allow him to dive bomb into objects, allowing us to open new paths by breaking them or knocking 
unlocking things out of them. There are two more abilities you can unlock, but like the arts, those are hidden in obscure side quests. For the most part, this is the only complaint I really have about how exploration is handled. Though in the third act of the story, I will say there's a bit too much backtracking. In terms of technical aspects, this isn't exactly the best showing for the series either. Since we're still on exploration, let's start again with the overworld. The draw distance here is generally low and the FPS is similarly stunted. Though certain zones such as the bridge over water really take a hit, feel like, like the game could crash at any moment. Camera speed and movement speed feels a little slower than it should here, and just overall for how much I love the overworlds, this is not one of the better executed ones for the series. Though we do get a number of ways to better explore them as the game goes along, including the traditional ships and airships, as well as a fast travel system, which unlocks a good two thirds of the way through. Being a PlayStation 2 game, this also contains a number of curious PlayStation 2 era issues. These ligers here are spelt with an E in dialogue, but an A in common. Combat. The overworld music here glitches out and just plays whatever the last tune you heard in a dungeon or town was until you progress the story again. If you interact with this door here, you just get a blank text box. The text box here can't figure out how to stay on screen. Dealing damage to some creatures who only have one HP while on their back will show damage counters but won't actually do anything until they enter their next animation. This is true for enemies dealing damage to you while you're on your back at one HP as well. This enemy is just floating. And as a word of warning, if there's a clear file on the memory card you're using at all, even if you didn't load a new game from it, when you find the NPC rather early Early on who lets you view old skits, they will all already be unlocked. If this is your first playthrough, do not scroll through these. These titles alone will spoil a lot of the main story events. And I guess the skits warrant a mention too. I, I gotta say, these are top tier for the series. Very few of them feel like filler that could have or should have been cut from the main game. One of my biggest issues with Berseria was the overabundance of skits, namely because so many of them felt too small and unimportant to be included, and they halted my gameplay far too frequently for how little value they actually gave. Abyss has a fair amount of skits too, but with grave exception, they all feel worth the time to read. There is no voice acting in the skits, and if there's no background music at the time, they can feel a little like they're happening in a void, which can be jarring, but otherwise, they're fantastic. I wasn't too hot on the brown backgrounds for the character portraits, but I guess that's meant to go along with the bulletin board look of the save screen here, so at least there's some continuity to it. Otherwise, in terms of technical issues, you know, this game doesn't really stand out. Just the usual stuff stuff that's typically ironed out these days. Most of the technical issues don't actually have a large or lasting effect, and where the game needs to run well the most in combat, it does. Though I will say, being from this era, there's a number of weirdly placed Evangelion references. But like, I'm not the only one who sees this, right? This right here is 100% the Lance of Longinus design from Evangelion, and they named it accordingly as well, though in combat it sadly does not carry the image. Now I would never, ever, in a million years force an Evangelion reference where it doesn't belong, or let you know you can score Killer, Ava, and other anime shirts by following the link in the description and using promo code TARX for 10% off your order or TARX20 for 20% off orders with three or more items on IcedTAesthetics.com. Never. Wouldn't be me. Link in the description. Otherwise, in terms of sound, the music is a mixed bag. Motoy's work sounds like Motoy's work. It's good, but thanks to an overexposure of it over the years, it no longer feels like anything special. Some of the tracks sound a little unfinished or poorly mixed, but they are rare. The sound effects are typical for the series, and the voice acting is actually pretty good. Actually, for the era, I think the voice acting is fantastic. The game length does feel just a little on the longer side because of how padded Act 3 feels, but it'll run anywhere from 55 to 70 hours depending on how much you do, and it does fit pretty well. Now we get to the last bit, the fun bit, the characters and the themes, and why exactly this game still stands the test of time despite so many things in it maybe having aged a bit. This is the most complicated part to discuss without spoilers, and I will try my best to not spoil this for those looking to play. Though saying that, it's gonna make some of this maybe not as clear as I would like it to be, but we're not getting any younger, so let's give it a shot. 
I mentioned earlier that Tales of the Abyss weaves its characters, its themes, and its adventure together very intricately, in ways we rarely see these days. If I could pick two modern games that maybe come close, they'd be Yakuza 6 and 7, though this may still be one level above in terms of execution. To put it broadly, Tales of the Abyss has many themes, but the big one that seems to overshadow everything, for me, is a theme of personal identity. As we embark on our journey to save the world, our characters are going through journeys to save themselves. However, our characters rarely fully understand understand themselves or the world that's set before them in need of salvation. With every new plot development, the world gets reshaped, and with the reshaping of the world, the characters internalize new dilemmas that cause the gears of cognitive dissonance to start turning and force them into tough positions where they must buckle down, truly reflect, and come to a deeper understanding of themselves and the world at large. With said deeper understanding, they may set out once again to change the world. Only of course upon changing the world with their newfound sense of self, the change they make in the world causes more more internal conflicts for the cast, and forces them back to the drawing board. Time and time again throughout the journey, our characters are forced to face themselves. To face themselves as they once were, as they believe they are, and as they must become to truly save the world. With a cast of such imperfect characters, Aldrin comes to suffer a great deal from our actions, and our actions cause the world in turn to reconsider things about itself, such as the politics that govern the land, and the religions and guiding principles the people of Aldrin believe. Though it may sound villainous to an extent, our character's journey to save the world is one that ultimately tears it down to rebuild it as they tear down and rebuild themselves, in the ever harrowing journey to understand and who they are as individuals and members of this society. There is a near-perfect reflection between the character's understanding of themselves and the world's understanding of itself. As one changes and acts, so too does the other, in an almost unbelievably intimate display of symbiotic relationships. Luke alone makes the journey from an arrogant and hot-headed noble to a born-again warrior with a debilitating inferiority complex, then to the hero the world needs, stoic and measured, and ready to bear the weight of his responsibility, and ready to carry all through to a brighter future. As he makes this journey, at different stages he takes on different sets of responsibilities. The arrogant noble is just looking to return home, until the promise of becoming a hero leads him astray and sends him blindly barreling down paths he doesn't yet know how to navigate. The born-again warrior with an inferiority complex is looking to atone for the actions he committed as an arrogant noble. Though certain revelations about himself makes him feel deep down, despite wanting and trying to be a savior, that he would ultimately be incapable and that his life is of very little value. The hero the world needs, stoic and measured, is one that has come to grips with who he is and what he has done, and where his value truly lies in the world, and he sees fit not to let petty, despairing thoughts rob him of what he's truly capable of. Likewise, throughout this journey, we see Aldrin's political tensions shift, waning, exploding, being sidelined in the face of greater issues, and ultimately discovering a peace blossoming from the ashes of the treachery that built the world. Over the 15 years from the date of its release, Tales of the Abyss has stood the test of time due to the intimate relationships established in the writing. The journey to save the world and the character journey, though fundamentally different, are in fact one and the same, unified from the very beginning to the very end. Where many stories these days may write a character arc onto an adventure and the two can be mostly viewed as separate, Tales of the Abyss absolutely cannot. As such, it does make it hard to convey the brilliance of its execution, but Tales of the Abyss is undoubtedly one of the most brilliantly written JRPGs of the generation, and perhaps just of the genre in general. To fully understand what I'm talking about, you absolutely need to play Tales of the Abyss. There's really no true way around it, and this is a game that should remain in conversation permanently as a must-play JRPG. Quite frankly, I can't do it justice in a video like this, and I never really intended to. I'm not even gonna try. Such a task honestly just seems incredibly unreasonable. But saying that, I may have more Tales of the Abyss content coming soon, for those who are maybe a little more curious. With that though, 
this is where I leave things today. One last thank you to Ice Tea Aesthetics for their sponsorship. Head by their website, check out their clothing, use promo code TARX to save 10% off your order, or TARX20 for three items or more to save 20%. Score yourself some sick Ava, Berserk, or Attack on Titan merch, or any of the other numerous eye-catching original designs. It's a good way to support me and this channel, and the merch is actually really cool. But yeah, that's all for today, folks. If you guys like this video, you know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe, share the video if you can. Links to all of my socials and my Patreon support page are in the description below. And as always, folks, thanks for watching.